Hello everyone and welcome to HowDoYouFeel.live. I'm Alana Wesley, your host and moderator, and I'm also the founder of Immersive Futures, the thought leadership event and content series. So for those of you who are new to How Do You Feel, this movement is really about inspiring global empathy and bringing audiences around the world together at a time when we've been so physically apart. Um, we think it's really important that um, we kind of bring like-minded business leaders together and that's why we've decided to host these talks. We'll be sharing what they've been up to during the pandemic and lockdown, what their businesses have been doing in response. We also think it's really important to study human behavior and psychology and so we'll be sharing what everyday people around the world have been feeling and having a bit of a discussion and debate about what that means for the future of business and how we can make, make a positive impact on community as we move forward. So before we get started, I'd just like to say a couple of quick thank yous. First of all, to the production family and also to um, Virtual Stage from Really Creative Media who um, helped produce these talks today. And also to the Simpler team who launched HowDoYouFeel.Live. Um, so for all of you, um, this is an interactive session, so please keep your questions coming throughout. Uh, you need to be logged into the YouTube live stream in order to do that. Um, today's about 45 minutes long and there'll be three sections which I will guide you through as we get to them. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker, who is Damien Kimmelman. Damien is the founder of Judil. He's also the co-founder of um, um, the um, uh, several fintech companies, including Row.co and the Founders Pledge. Um, and then he recently founded Battelle, which is a sleep school for children. Uh, Damien's a widely celebrated fintech entrepreneur, so we're really lucky to have him with us today. Uh, welcome to you, Damien, and sorry for uh, my mumble there. No worries. Thank you for having me. And our next speaker is our, our resident speaker, Ben Jenkins, who will be joining us every single week. Um, ben is the founder of Simpler, and he is also the brains behind HowDoYouFeel.Live. Ben was a brand strategist and ethnographer and has spent his career studying um, youth culture and technology and where the two intersect. So welcome to you, Ben. Hi, Alana. Thank you. Cool. So for the first part of our interview today, we're going to be learning about what Ben and Damien have been doing during the pandemic and what their business has been doing in response. So my qu first question is for you, Damien. Um, the Tell Your um, New Online Sleep School is quite the departure from anything that you've done in the fintech world before. So I'd love to hear kind of what inspired you to create the Tell in the first place. But also, what's it been like launching a, an online business during a pandemic? Um, how are you feeling about it all? Um, I couldn't be, I'm um, sorry, I'm having technical trouble. Ah, oh, the new normal. And, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Okay. So, um, it's, been, it's been crazy. Um, we started the tell about two and a half months ago. Mm. Um, so I pulled the trigger on the tell um, uh, just two or three weeks before the lockdown. Um, essentially for everybody, because you probably don't know about the tell, um, we do a remote sleep school for children age uh, four months to four years old. Um, we teach kids um, and their parents how to, how to go to sleep within five minutes um, in under a week, guaranteed. Um, wow, that's quite the claim. <laughs> um, and um, uh, it's been booming, right? People um, are stuck at home um, without any extra help. Mm. They have to be on work calls like this. Um, at the same time, they're supposed to put their babies or children um, uh, to naps um, in the middle of the day while they're supposed to be on Zooms. Um, and people have been far, far closer to a problem that was already the number one problem for any, any, um, uh, you know, any parents with newborns. Um, and um, it's been quite dramatic because every single um, parent that we teach, you know, goes through this sort of um, series of emotions um, and to see people from being in utter despair, you know, some literally on the brink of, of divorce, um, to crying um, and in with happiness um, is pretty um, uh, pretty dramatic. I wouldn't have changed my career um, so dramatically 
um, if I didn't think it was such a big problem to solve. It's one of these non-obvious sort of problems that has a profound impact on society. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing that, Damien. Um, ben, the next question's for you. Um, so on Simpler's website, you refer to what you do as creating empathetic technology, which enables organisations to get to the heart of how people really feel at scale. So this must be a pretty fascinating time for your business right now. So I'd love to hear what you've been learning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so really what that's getting at, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, uh, in the next session, is that we're, we're kind of trying to understand the world more qualitatively. Um, so we've actually seen sort of at a top line um, a very different client and a very different consumer. So from a client perspective, um, people are coming to us from all kinds of categories that just don't know how to ask questions about the future at the moment. So we've got people from airline industry. We've got people from um, health uh, and wellness. You know, a number of hospitals um, and healthcare practices are talking to us. They go, we can see the stats. We can see that there's a 40% decline in numbers. We have no clue about what that means because we've got no models that can predict why any of that is happening. It could be all number of things. So while you can look at the statistics, you can't look at the future using what those are. So people are coming to us basically going, help us understand the why. And then from a consumer perspective, um, a respondent perspective, we are really noticing a difference in the way people are answering questions. So there's a real openness to talk about feelings. It almost feels like there's a sort of dearth of, of talking to people uh, in, in any forum face to face, so they're kind of much more comfortable with sharing a more vulnerable self uh, ordinarily. And I think finally, we're noticing a different tone in the way brands are talking to each other, uh, to talking to consumers. There's still some some bad apples, but I think generally there's this sense that the world got a bit closer, strangely enough, because we're all going through something that's quite similar. Mm, that's great. Thank you, Ben. Um, Damien. Um, so I'd like to hear a bit about what the Founders Pledge have been doing, because um, they've launched this Global Impact and Innovation Fund in response to COVID. Um, and I know that the work that you do there is really to help the startup ecosystem. So, um, you know, we're, we're hearing all about a global recession on the horizon. You know, what's your advice to would-be entrepreneurs and startup communities? And is this actually a good time to be starting something new? Um, and, you know, it, it, I'd really like to hear kind of what your advice is to these people. Okay, I, um, there's a lot to unpack there. One, uh, just for clarity, what, what Founders Pledge is, um, we try, with, um, over the last four to five years, we've raised two and a half billion in pledges, um, two and a half billion dollars worth of pledges. Um, we fulfilled about 440 million dollars worth of pledges into um, uh, donations. Um, uh, and we try to focus largely on effective altruism organizations or organizations that deal in existential threats. So um, a lot of the um, work that we've done is really on things like pandemics or, you know, the, the, um, the ethics of robotics or, you know, uh, asteroid detection. Um, and we try and educate founders on how to give more thoughtfully to charity. Um, um, and so that's, that's one thing. And this has been um, an amazing experience and like horrible experience in so many ways for so many people, but it's really been an amazing experience um, in all of the ways that, that, that Ben's talked about. I think that there's been an incredible, yeah, you know, just, yeah, you know, from, from my own perspective, um, coming together um, and, you know, we've completely changed the ways that we've um, been working, which is really exciting. On the point of, like, whether this is a good time to, to build a business, um, it's always a good time to build a business depending on what the business is. Um, but um, typically, um, great businesses, um, uh, you know, really uh, transformative businesses get built in these kinds of um, times, um, largely because um, there's such a change um, in you know, the way things are being done that it uh, opens up space for new entrants and new um, for people to uh, create brand new uh, business models. Right, um, our business, um, Patel, we don't have any office. We don't. We're completely distributed across three different continents, 
from day one, that's like, that's pretty cool. Like right? there were tons of businesses before like that, but there are like a quantum difference um, in the number of, of distributed businesses now. Ben, I see you nodding your head avidly. Would you like to share any comments on that before we move on? No, I'm, I'm just agreeing. Love it. Um, I think, yeah, I think it is, a, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, is, you know, we, a lot of people have more downtime to think about things than they ever did. And others of us are absolutely um, ridden with uh, nonstop business requests. So I think, you know, for those of you out there who are kind of considering starting something new, you heard it from Damien first. Now is a good time if you've got the right idea. Um, so I'd like to now move to um, uh, our audience questions and invite Harry from the team at Simpler to join us and share a question, please. Hi, thanks, Alana. Yeah, um, I think this is a question for both of you. You've both talked a lot about what it's like to run a business, uh, you know, during this pandemic. But I, I think the question is what sort of how have the last two or three months changed your longer term outlook? Ben, do you want to kick off? Yeah, I mean, I this is something that's just come up in the last, you know, when this all started, it definitely felt like there was intellectually a need for more questions to be asked. So therefore more need for a company that does research. What has emerged in the, really the last few weeks is just how massive that has become because where we started, you know, all the news was talking about key industries, travel, you know, hospitality and certain things that anything that was physical that you couldn't do anymore. And then it started to transpire that it's everything, you know, cities are going to be affected, you know, entire ecosystems on which everything else is built is, has been affected. So if cities are decentralized, then everything else is going to be affected. Everything that happens in a city, um, uh, other things, you know, uh, fear around health, you know, people not going to the doctors as much. And what does that do for the drug industry? So long term for me, I feel like, the, the industry that is about asking questions uh, about now and about the future is going to transform completely. Models, benchmarks, and the way that we ask questions is going to be dramatically, at a very philosophical level, completely transformed. The types of questions are going to be asked uh, are, are going to be different. And in every industry, we won't be able to get away now without um, looking, you know, uh, without asking new questions about how, how we have to start again in so many different ways. Thank you, Ben. Damien, would you like to share any thoughts as well? Yeah, in a very abstract way and, and sort of to Ben's point, I think that there's going to be, um, at least from like a data perspective, there's going to be sort of a bifurcation um, where um, people are going to naturally um, seek more qualitative um, you know, uh, uh, insights. And I think that that's it's hugely valuable. Um, they're also going to seek to build much, much more complex models and simulations. Right now, um, um, you know, most modeling, whether it be the economy, is very mechanical. Um, mm. uh, and um, it's ridiculously useless. Um, uh, and that has a profound impact on everything from people's credit scores, you know, um, to uh, how do you, you know, really um, quantify GDP, right? All of these things, how do you, how do you, how do you allocate assets um, for the, the, the government? Um, and you're going to start to see, um, I think, um, many businesses and many governments start to move towards um, sort of simulations um, very, very complex simulations of um, the uh, economy. And ultimately, I think that that's really good. And um, look, um, yeah, but I, uh, there's, you know, there's a very important place for qualitative information. And there's a very important place for like these simulations. Um, and you can't look at them sort of in isolation from one another. 
Yeah. Totally. I think, we all, I think we all feel that, don't we? And I think on that note, that segues us perfectly into our next section. Um, and thank you for the question um, to our audience that asked it. It was a great one. Um, we're now going to hear about what everyday people around the world are feeling and kind of what those kind of tell us as we move to the future and how we can use that anecdotal information. So, Ben, I know you've prepared a few highlights and some videos, but before you go into that, could you actually explain to everybody what how do you feel dot live is and kind of what inspired you and the team at simpler to um launch it in the first place and why you think it's important and for everyone that's watching um in a couple of minutes a video of how do you feel dot live will play in the background so you can get a feel for it for yourselves thanks ben yeah so thank you so in the last couple of years before coronavirus we'd been on a mission to sort of go deeper into a more qualitative empathetic as we talk about an almost sort of human way of looking at research you know um, and absolutely uh, agree that qual and quant, a more statistic based and a more you know, visceral humanistic approach are necessary and that they have, they've always worked together. Um, but in the recent last few years, there's been an undue focus on the, the numbers. And the problem with numbers is that you lose a lot of humanity in, in that. Um, so our approach, but, but numbers are much cheaper to scale. Um, it's much easier when you're working with um, statistics to put everything in boxes and, and scale it up and do it in a short amount of time. What we have done in the last couple of years is we focused on a new new technology that really wasn't around five, six years ago, which is messaging apps. We're now spending most of our time, most of our days communicating very personally, one-on-one -on -one through messaging apps. Therefore, it's a great environment for research. It's a great environment to have conversations that just feel much more kind of intimate and personal. But we've added to that um, chatbots um, and chatbots while they have bad press in other spaces um, uh, I think we have we would argue a brilliant therapists they are great at getting to people's kind of like core desires um, they're like a good interviewer in a way they're, they're, they're better than um, uh, uh, than sort of bad interviewers so when the coronavirus hit uh, we decided and what you're seeing in the back is uh, is how do you feel we decided to launch how do you feel because we started to feel sort of distant from people. Um, not only did we lose direction about what's going on in the future, but who, what are strangers doing? What are the people on the bus? What are the people in the, in the office that, space that I work in doing? And you lose that sense of direction, but also connection um, beyond just your bubble. Um, so how do you feel live was launched in order to kind of like get out of our bubble and see what feelings uh, and, and what real people are doing across the world. So a lot of these are kind of stories, they're video diaries, they're anecdotes. But when you put them together with kind of what we've got is a global map of kind of sentiments and feelings. Um, and so that was what um, that was all about. And so I was going to share a couple of uh, thoughts that we've learned from it. Thank you, Ben. Yes, it would be great to hear um, a couple of um, key highlights that you picked up on this week. Um, and everybody each week, Ben, will share new highlights and insights. So a couple of my favorites from this week were kind of deliberately con kind of contradictory. So we've heard a lot about these two sides of one is that technology, and we even talked about it, sort of the increased digitization, technology is, is suddenly being supercharged. Uh, people who had never jumped on a Zoom, grandma's on Zoom now. People who had never been on Zoom are now on it. Uh, people are using types of technology, telemedicine that they've never used before. And that's gonna continue throughout, which is absolutely uh, very likely. At the same time, we're also seeing this sort of back to basics. We're seeing this sort of going back to growing your own veg and cooking your own food and, and things that, and, and talking to your extended family, talking to grandma that you'd never done before. Our, what we've noticed in a lot of the conversations that we've been having is that people are using one to help the other. So, you know, these, these great, great quotes about, um, I had never used uh, Zoom before. I was just too frightened. Now I'm having three hour conversations with family members I haven't spoken to for, for a decade. Um, or oh, this is great quote here about, uh, we used uh, a mixer three times in two days, and it's been sitting, even though it's been sitting in storage for several years, I usually just mix with a fork. Uh, I learned that cake, deviled eggs, and brownies taste much, very different with a mixer. You know, we're, we're finally dusting off uh, our Instapot air fryer that we were given for Christmas two years ago. Um, we've pulled out the magic bullet to make morning smoothies every day. So things that people are doing to go backwards are being enhanced by technologies that are associated with going, going forwards, which I just find a really interesting, kind of unusual, more unusual nugget. Um, the second is another sort of potential contradiction. So 
millennials, the, the scourge of being able to do anything well themselves, seem to have picked up a new joy for doing stuff that really, the last time we saw it, it was really being done by the greatest generation. That's the generation who are older, who were born before 1945. So um, stitching old clothes back together, making things, making masks has been a big story. Um, making your own food, baking your own bread, growing your own food, um, and even, you know, saving money. And it feels like saving money has been, for a long time, especially in America, saving money has almost sort of been the devil's work um, because it doesn't drive the economy. And so we've been discouraged from doing it. Um, and there's some really, and, and of all people, really the, the millennials were not the ones that had really been trained to do it because even their, their parent boomers uh, weren't doing it. Um, well, I've got this great quote about a very creative uh, way of saving uh, loo paper. Um, so I, this is the quote. I'm being very mindful of how many sheets of toilet paper I use. And I've definitely noticed the roll lasting longer. I couldn't get my usual brand. The only thing left was four ply. Four ply sheets are very luxurious and I love it. But I've been pulling the sheets apart to make two ply with double the length, turning three sheets of four ply into six sheets of two ply. Um, so people are kind of getting really into these uh, these different ways uh, of kind of like being not themselves, uh, picking up new habits. And the final uh, one I want to share today is this sense of communal responsibility. So another another flip, really, because especially in Western cultures where individualism is sacred, this idea of words that include the word communal or social um, typically kind of um, stayed away from. But even in the UK, where um, there's this one guy who's talking about the last thing he wanted to do was go and, and, and clap uh, uh, on his doorstep where he gets where his neighbors would see him because he, he's not really very sociable. But the minute he you know pushed himself to do it, he noticed it's sort of new things opening up for him. Um, and another thing is like a sort of like return to sort of post world World War II values. There's this one great quote here from someone in the UK: "The future could be amazing. We could we could see a global aha moment where." we realize that we're interconnected after all and that we can take collective action and save the planet like grand planes and industries once in a while. My fervent wish is like the aftermath of World War II which, where so much was sacrificed by so many, we can have a global new deal where the most venal aspects of capitalism are tempered by a new green deal of Keynesian economics. Uh, and, and this is one where I want to show a video from a lady um, just outside of London who think kind of like nicely sums up one of those sentiments as well. So I live on Canvey Island, which is about an hour outside of London. And we have a really, really close knit community. Um, people joke about it being an island, which is why it's so close. Uh, but since this pandemic started, I've never seen people be as community spirited as they are now. People are leaving boxes outside their house with, with um, printouts for children to do. Um, every window has a rainbow in it. There's signs out thanking the bin men. On the local community pages, there's people offering to, to cook meals for people they've never met and deliver them. Um, people just have to ask for some shopping and, and everyone jumps in to try and help. It, it's absolutely beautiful. And I think having that kind of community is what sets our town apart from, from so many others. And I think that's what's going to help us get through, through this pandemic in one piece. Lovely, and I, um, I think um, I can definitely relate, Ben, to the uh, trend about um, in the UK feeling a little bit out of my comfort zone, clapping for the NHS, and, and, and kind of what that was like afterwards. It was it was a kind of an out of character experience for us culturally, but it really really felt amazing, like feeling that we were part of the community. Um, and a lot of my friends messaged me after the first time we did it, so I, that really rings true for me. So I really recommend that everybody goes on How Do You Feel Live and you know share how you're feeling and see how other people are feeling and share it with your networks. Um, so Damien, that was a plethora of insights and information. Um, do any of them kind of ring true for the things that you've been learning or indeed is there another trend that you've kind of observed that you think is quite important as we move forward out of the pandemic? I'm like, a, um, am I on mute? No, I'm not. Um, I think that there, <clears throat> there are almost so many trends. I think um, the thing that I keep on um, finding astonishing um, is um, for every trend, there's a counter trend. It's, it's been such a, um, a transformational uh, period over the course of so many, you know, never before had 
so many lives been impacted ever, mm. ever in the history of humanity. Never before have so many lives been impacted in, at the same time. Um, and so for every trend, there's uh, a counter trend. Um, I feel like I'm living in a simulation because I, I, I read an article that, you know, in The Economist that smokers aren't um, uh, dramatically adversely affected by COVID-19. Like, something is really messed up in this situation. Mm. Um, I, um, I personally um, have, you know, had a, an amazing experience um, over the last few weeks, um, largely because uh, uh, so many of my, you know, it's said that it takes three weeks for, you know, your average adult to change their habits. Well, you know, you have a whole, you have billions of people changing their habits over the course of several months. Um, and that to me is, is pretty dramatic. So any of these things that are quite obvious, right? Like, um, you know, like the mass digitization of, um, uh, of, of the workplace, right? Like mm. um, everybody has um, you know, gone through a massive digital transformation. Yes, but that has second order, third order consequences that are really quite profound and different. Um, and um, they, will, they will restructure um, how, we, um, how we work, how we live, um, you know, um, some of the, the more personal, um, you know, uh, stories, um, you know, I, I realized I'm, I'm a fucking introvert. Sorry to curse, but like, I didn't know that I was an introvert. Um, I um, realized, um, you know, that um, how much work I can achieve um, in the course of the day. Thank you for that, Damien. I think we can all relate to quite a few of those things. Um, I'm quite the extrovert and I've actually discovered the beauty of uh, being an introvert myself and really taken a lot of joy in that. Um, so um, before we move to the final part of today's interview, where we're going to look to the future and talk about a few predictions, um, I'd like to invite Harry back to share another audience question, please, with our guests. Hey, yes. Yeah, so this is a question that's recurring a couple of times. Uh, both of you were talking about this, the big behavioral changes that people are making. Um, but these, we've seen people make big behavioral changes under periods of extreme stress before, right? I think World War II is a great example. So the question is, how do, how do both of you see these change? Do you see these changes sort of taking hold on a longer term basis? Or what are the implications of these, you know, the changes under the couple months of isolation as we move out into the world? Anything, yeah. anything, 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 People, once they get a shock to the system, you know, it takes a, a, a long time for them to, to, to adjust, right? Um, this is a new normal. We spent 20 years, you know, um, in fear, not me, but 20 years in fear of, of terrorism, right? Mm -hmm. After 3,000 people were, you know, um, killed in, in the World Trade Center. Um, I think that this is far more dramatic in terms of, um, people's habits um, than that. I mean, it's far wider reaching implications. Both so positive and negative. Ben, would you like to share anything? Yeah, no, I completely agree that there's no way that this can't have longer lasting effects. I think there'll be some things that people bounce back from. I think people are hoping to bounce back from. But there's other things that, A, structurally and infrastructure wise, they won't be able to bounce back from. Um, I'm getting a bit of feedback now as well, um, because because the things have changed, you know, uh, beyond beyond repair. And I think the things I'm talking about with cities and infrastructure um, and technology in the workplace, you know, uh, my kind of like older family members, I don't think they're going to going to go back on not using technology to communicate now, which I think is a good thing. 
Um, but there's some more emotional stuff that I'm noticing as well that I think, you know, for the, since apparently since 1979, there's a study showing that empathy in people had been going down. And in the last few years since social media, it had been declining even further. I'm seeing that word coming out in news reports and from, from the lips of people you would never expected, like, like George W. Bush using that word in a, in, a, in a speech that you would never have expected it. So I feel like people's need for emotional proximity and understanding other people, I think is really gonna grow out of this. And I think, because that's not something that isn't good for us. I think that's another thing at a sort of emotional structural level will I think continue in a, in a really big way beyond this. So maybe that's the optimist in me, but uh, so uh, I think there's gonna be uh, physical structures and emotional structures that are, are gonna be uh, for good. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for that question from our audience. Um, so we're going to move to the um, final part of today's uh, session where we're going to talk about the future. Um, and Damien, my first question is for you. Um, so the pandemic will continue to have a significant impact on our global economy and in the UK in particular, we're not just focusing on the UK today, but for us, we've got Brexit still to navigate as well. Um, what should the leaders of organisations prioritise and prepare for in order to positively drive changes to come and remain relevant um, in this kind of new economic environment? So I'll try and answer this quickly, but in a roundabout way, excuse me. Um, so look, I, I was very um, against Brexit like I'm sure a lot of people in the audience were, um, but um, it's very hard to, 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 to discount that um, uh, some of the effects of, of Brexit actually had a positive effect on ways that we um, have been dealing with um, uh, the pandemic. Um, and what I, what I can say is that um, for the last 30, 40 years, we've been focused as society at optimizing, optimizing supply chains, optimizing like uh, optimization to the extent. And when you think about you know optimization, it comes at the cost of resiliency. Um, and so, um, what's the future hold? Dramatic resiliency, right? What are some of the consequences of resiliency? You know, as Ben said, savings. You know, um, a stockpiling, whatever, using. A two sheets or, or four sheets of, of toilet paper, whatever it may be. The, the point is, is like, um, you know, it's, um, you know, uh, it's actually, um, you know, in a lot of ways to the detriment of, of the likes of China, when we've been optimizing these supply chains so much that we had such a heavy reliance on, you know, so few countries. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of made in the UK, um, made in the USA, uh, coming back um, from a number of reasons, not just uh, because of people's fear. Great, thank you for that. Um, a very well-rounded answer to quite a big question there. Um, ben, I'll try not to make you so nasty. Here's one for you. Um, so returning to work is the next big frontier for our society. And as a business leader yourself, What's your advice for um, leaders of organizations and fellow founders who need to inspire their teams in these uncertain times? Um, yeah, another, another pretty broad one. Um, but <laughs> um, I, all, all I could talk about is what, <clears throat> what this has taught us from in the last 11 weeks. You know? So when we started this, I suppose our biggest fear was jobs and you know, a very instant and kind of like innate fear that, you know, you, you want to protect yourself. And, you know, the, the hardest thing was to not suddenly sort of like pitch, pitch for business and, and also keep everyone occupied. So mm. actually, I would say at least 50% of the reason why we launched How Do You Feel wasn't just for the outside world, it was for, for us to give us something to do. And I think, you know, every kind of self-help guru talks about, you know, have purpose and do something that you know connects you to other people and so i've certainly noticed you know our team has actually grown during the pandemic and uh and it, the hardest thing was and some of these people have never worked with this physically yet and so the hardest thing was not kind of coming into work and having that those sort of like chats when you first get in the morning um so our, a big thing for us was having a, a purposeful thing to work on and that's really galvanized us so 
Um, you know, not everyone can, else can do that, but I've certainly found that having a mission-based project that, um, which we've been very fortunate enough to, to do ourselves has really kind of like galvanized us and provided a lot more inspiration and kind of like energy uh, for all of us. Liam, love that. Um, so I think we've got time for um, one more que question for you both, um, which um, is, you know, and you've covered a few of these, but maybe something new, kind of what lesson has COVID personally taught you so far in this lockdown period that you kind of intend to take forward in your personal life or in business? Um, maybe Damien, you can start. Can I, can I think about that a little bit more? Go on then, Ben. Um, I, I personally, uh, and I think I heard this in one of Damien's answers as well. I, I'm surprised by how little I miss. Um, so, this sort of reminds me more of like what it was like living in the English countryside in, you know, when I was 15. Um, mm. And I sort of just slotted back into that where you just have to find stuff to do. And, and weirdly, because, because I, I probably didn't have a, a, you know, loads of like outside stimulus in those days, I just clocked, slotted right back in, into that. So I've actually found quite a lot of um, other things to do in it. And it's a reminder of what, you know, Damien said about it takes three three weeks to completely change. The thing I've noticed personally and from the hundreds of people we've been speaking to around the world and how do you feel is that we're just really adaptable. Um, mm. You know, we, we have got used to, you know, while there was fear in the first few days and it's still in pockets of the world, more than just pockets, there's people going through some really bad stuff right now. Mm. Um, it, wherever we are, we're adapting and I think you know, my favorite person to listen to every day is, is Cuomo, the governor of New York, because um, he just talks about, let's not waste this opportunity, which has been really dramatic and pretty awful for a lot of people, but let's not waste this opportunity to come out of it radically different. He, was, mm. he talked about Hurricane Sandy and 9-11 a lot. And he was like, the amount of growth that we had after that and things that changed um, in terms of like how we did business, downtown Manhattan changed massively, um, the regeneration after Hurricane Sandy. And he's saying, you know, telemedicine and, and, and the ways that we do business have to radically change. And I think, I think you know, for me, that's what uh, I think is going to come out of this as well. We're going to mm. be different. We have adapted. And I think moving forward, we'll continue to. Great. Damien, would you like to share a final comment? I don't know. I've been working on my memory. Cool. Um, and I've been... Uh, um, been um, uh, being tutored by a, a world champion in memory competitions. Nice. So I've been um, trying to learn the first hundred and thousand digits of pi, learn how to memorize a deck of cards. <laughs> how far are you into those what digits? Else, what else do you do? Um, it's it's an amazing thing. Um, if anybody wants to buy a book, I'll, I'll give a shout out to uh, Dominic O'Brien. Um, unbelievable. He's eight-time world champion of uh, memory competitions. Um, Is that the Memory Palace? Is that what he works yeah, with? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And he, um, he can memorize um, 52 decks of cards. Not 52 cards, 52 decks of cards in like a couple hours. Right. Um, so if you're looking, that. if you're looking for something to do during the pandemic, everyone, there's your answer. If you're if you're out of ideas, um, I'm going to wrap up now because we're nearly out of time. Um, Damien, Ben, thank you so much for sharing all your ideas and thoughts. It's been great having you. Thank you. Every great. See you later. Um, and everybody, thank you so much for joining us today and for all your brilliant questions. I think being the bullshit Brits that we are, we had a cheeky swear word somewhere in there. So sorry about that if anyone's offended. Um, next week, you can tune in um, at four o'clock on Thursday, UK time, where we will have the director of Facebook planning joining us, Ian Edwards, for another session. Um, so all that's left for me to say is check out howdoyoufeel.live. Um, I hope you enjoyed today. Thank you again to the production family, to Virtual Stage and the team at Simpler. Um, see you soon and stay safe.